Hello, family. Hope everyone is doing well. I'd like to welcome you again to this uh, online worship service through YouTube video. Um, we're still going through a lot of issues and trials. As we all heard in the news, uh, the President of the United States has uh, tested positive um, with COVID and um, other officials as well. So <clears throat> um, the virus is still going out there and still active and we still have to continue to be careful um, as far as uh, ourselves are concerned, our health is concerned. So uh, please continue to practice uh, safe uh, uh, practices and being uh, careful when you go out. So for our um, worship today, we will have uh, a video from our president, Greg Williams. It's his uh, quarterly update video, and he's going to talk about uh, uh, future ministries and next uh, generation ministries in our uh, denomination. And the sermon today will be given um, by a pastor or a retired pastor, Mike Swaggerty from Sacramento. He gave this sermon uh, two weeks ago, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And um, <clears throat> he uh, talked about the uh, trials from a biblical perspective. And um, hope you enjoy that sermon. So, <clears throat> uh, Yoli will introduce the songs again today, but before that, I'd like to open in prayer. Dear God, our Father, we come before you once again for, uh, and thank you so much for this wonderful time that we can be together in, in spirit and in also, also in, uh, in this online uh, medium. We thank you for um, each other, thank you for our church and our denomination and we pray for our leaders as they continue to lead and guide everyone in our denomination in our uh, the body of Christ that is in uh, GCI so we just ask you now father to please bless everyone as we uh, praise you and as we worship you and uh, be encouraged by your words today as we also think about the national uh, situation, uh, polit political situation in our country. We pray, Lord, for our leaders, especially those who have uh, tested positive and all the others who are suffering from the virus. We pray for your blessing on them and for uh, their quick recovery. And also, uh, please comfort those who have lost loved ones and uh, many others who have suffered because of this pandemic. Lord, we also are going through fires and um, a lot of people are affected by the fire that's going on in uh, the Northern California area. And uh, we have other fires elsewhere. We pray, Lord, for your uh, comfort and for your uh, blessing on those people who have, who have been affected and have lost their homes and the properties. So we lift them up before you, Lord, knowing that you will uh, provide for them. Lord, we pray for all our seniors and our uh, sick brothers and sisters, and uh, we lift them up before you, Lord, and knowing that you will always uh, be with them and provide every every day uh, all all their needs. So we thank you, Lord, once again for uh, this time and we just uh, give uh, you thanks and give you praise and honor in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Hello church friends and families. I hope everyone is doing well. For our worship songs we have Blessed Be Your Name followed by what a Savior, 
And for closing song, we have Wonderful, Merciful Savior. And before that, I would like to read Zephaniah 3.17 For the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty Savior. He will take delight in you with gladness. With His love, He will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs.
I'm forever grateful that you have been faithful to me, Lord, for your amazing grace. But for your grace, I cannot be saved. Hello from Grace Communion International Home Office in Charlotte, North Carolina. By wearing this mask, I'm not making light of the far-reaching concerns of the COVID-19 pandemic. In fact, I'm drawing attention to how we need to show concern for others around us. There have been many lessons to be learned from this historical time when so many of us have been asked to work from home and to practice social distancing. Some have relearned the art of putting puzzles together. Our son's girlfriend has discovered the pleasure of decorating her home and patio with a variety of plants. Many have rediscovered cooking at home and then have had to come up with a home workout routine to exercise because of the cooking from home. And we're all discovering new ways to socialize while maintaining proper social distance. At the outset of the virus, a Saturday night street party was birthed in my neighborhood. It began with Susan and me and two nearby couples. We set chairs in our driveways and maintained clear and safe boundaries. Over each Saturday night, the party has grown. It starts at 7 o'clock p.m. and easily goes to 10 or 11 o'clock at night. We're getting to know our neighbors as friends, and what a blessing this has been. The pandemic has helped broaden my perspective. Have you considered the crises among the crisis? 
On Monday, April 6, the tiny Pacific Island country of Vanuatu was rocked by Cyclone Harold, the second Category 5 storm to hit the nation in five years. The cyclone led to the deaths of 27 and major destruction of properties and crops. The cyclone went on to flatten buildings and cause severe flooding in Fiji and Tonga. Our leaders in New Zealand have been tracking with the members and bringing much needed assistance. On the night of Easter Sunday, April 12, strong storms rolled across the southeastern United States. Our good friends Dennis and Sidney Weecroft, who live in Chattanooga, Tennessee, had a tornado strike their house and their youngest son Robert's house as well. No bodily injuries, thank God, but significant property damage. As I check in with our superintendents, I'm constantly amazed at the range of challenges. As Kalangule Keoma shared with me, many of the African countries are challenged by famine and starvation. Therefore, the coronavirus takes a back seat to the crisis of finding fresh water and food to eat on a day-to-day -day basis. This certainly adjusts my overall perspective. The pandemic has forced us to think about that ancient question that Cain posed to God, am I my brother's keeper? Wearing a mask is not simply about self-protection. It is an active way of displaying concern for the elderly and people with health challenges, such as coworkers with chronic illnesses or friends with autoimmune diseases. Many who appear healthy have compromised immunity and need for cautious care and encouraging support now more than ever. Are we stepping outside of our own experience and practicing extra precautions to help protect the weak among us. We've also been awakened to think about shut-ins and people who live alone. Are we calling and messaging them? Have we checked in face-to-face -face through FaceTime, Zoom, or WhatsApp? Our hearts have been turned to these people in fresh and appropriate ways. As we mourn the temporary cutback of our social gatherings, we experience a glimpse of their lives. How are we caring for these individuals in their time of complete isolation? It is especially heart-wrenching to think about people who have lost loved ones during this time. They have been robbed of visitations, sharing final moments and goodbyes, even the chance to honor their loved ones with a funeral service and burial. Are we reaching out in love and creating safe spaces for them to grieve? As a denomination, one of our setbacks during this crisis was the postponement of our denominational celebration. We are excited to announce the celebration will be in Charlotte, North Carolina over the dates of July 21st through July 25th in 2021. It will be a highlight to come together as a global family. Romans 12, 15 implores us, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Our empathy for one another has been awakened during this global health crisis. May it stay awake and vibrant, even as we move toward life beyond COVID-19 restrictions. I am Greg Williams, updating our Grace Communion International family. send my greetings and also just uh, thank you for watching. I know I'm an old fossil that you don't see much of, but uh, I think we will uh, we will give you something that I hope will be very encouraging to you today. But first of all, I'd like to uh, pause for a moment and if you'll join me, let's open with prayer. Our gracious God in heaven, we are thankful again to you for your love and mercy, and most of all, that in this confused world in which we live, you've opened our minds to see the truth. And uh, if we have that, then we really have everything. So, Father, today we're going to take a section of Scripture that you inspired to be written down for your people in all times, whenever they lived, and whatever the circumstances. But it has special relevance to us as it did to the folks in the New Testament when it was written for them. So we ask your blessing on the message as it's given, as well as on the hearing when it's received. And we commit this time into your hands now, in the name and by the authority of Jesus Christ. Amen. 
A couple of weeks ago, around sunrise, as my normal habit has become, I was sitting back on my all-weather sun porch, and as I say, the sun was about ready to rise, and I have to make a confession to you, I was having a pity party. Does everybody know what a pity party is? Surely you know what a pity party is. That's where you sit down and uh, the whole world is against you and nothing is going right and it's just uh, boo-hoo and everything is bad. Now, what was making me have a pity party? Well, part of this uh, you'll recognize immediately if you live in California. If you don't, some of it you won't. But, of course, there was the virus. Uh, do you want to call it COVID-19? Uh, whatever fancy name you want to put on it. But uh, the virus, to say the least, has got our society tied into knots. It was, uh, it was affecting my normal routine. And as all of you know, over the years, I'm a very much a status quo person who does not like my routine interrupted. So I was having a pity party over that. And if you'll remember here in California a couple, three weeks ago, we were in the midst of an insufferable heat wave. One day after another, 105 to 110, 105 to 110. And, 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 and the heat was just bad, just bad. Now, to complicate all that, we had fires. And we still have fires burning in California, of course, as I give you this message today. But we had them then, and there was smoke everywhere. And you'd just smell it. You could feel it. Sometimes when it got bad, you could actually see the ash forming on your car. And uh, it was uh, so the virus and the heat and the, and the fires. And I'll tell you what was really depressing me. There was no church service. Yes, I know I made terrible comments about the people in our congregation, calling them miserable comforters and a few other things. But they're my friends. They're all I got. They have to take me whether they like it or not. So at any rate, I was missing my friends. But you know, as I was sitting there having my pity party, I began to think about folks that had some real trials that they were suffering from. You see, I talked about a virus, but I had not been hospitalized or in intensive care or had to perform a funeral for one of my close friends or relatives or mate or children who had died of the virus. To me, it was just a nuisance to be dealt with. And as far as fires are concerned, my house hadn't been burned to the ground. But if you had been, of course, watching some of the videos, which I'm sure gone worldwide many times over, almost every newscast is an interview with someone somewhere who was standing beside what used to be their house, their barn, their outbuildings, and maybe their RV and their car, and it's just absolutely like an atomic bomb went off. It's nothing but a pile of rubble and ash and cinders. Now, those folks got a real problem on their hands. Uh, I wasn't like, uh, just to contrast another part of the country, the people who have recently suffered from Hurricane Sally. And you look at some of the flooding that they've gone through, some of the damage that happened from the wind when it first hit uh, landfall. And they're sitting there looking at a house with water up to the eaves. Uh, everything they have is saturated and ruined. And maybe some of them don't even have flood insurance. Now, those are some folks with some real problems. How about the small business people by the thousands who, thanks to coronaviruses, had thriving businesses that are now bankrupt, with nowhere to go, and, 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 and what are they going to do uh, to make their lives back in order? Trials, problems, difficulties, sufferings. But there's one thing that you can find if you're a Bible-reading individual is that the, the problem of trials and sufferings is not new to the Bible. As a matter of fact, it, it uh, takes up the pages of quite a large percentage of the Bible, and uh, God describes the trials of his people. I would like to look today a little different perspective of trials from a biblical perspective. And again, I said there's many places we could do this, but I'm going to take one small section of Scripture found in the book of 1 Peter. Now, let me give you a little background about the book of 1 Peter before we go there. I think all of you know it's a small letter up toward the end of the New Testament. 
As the name implies, it was written by the Apostle Peter, one of the twelve. And it was designed and written to Jewish members who were scattered. Scattered literally all over the Mediterranean area, the Roman Empire, here and there. Circulated, I suppose, uh, and, and maybe copies were made of it and so on. But it was meant to give these people who were persecuted and suffering and having their own trials comfort and hope because the Christians who were Jews were persecuted by their Jewish brethren who despised them for embracing Jesus as Messiah and Lord and you know God come in the flesh of course the Romans you know despised these Christians because they refused to bend to Caesar and uh, they worshipped only one God and would not give homage to Caesar. So the Romans didn't particularly care for them either. And many of them were on the run. They'd had everything they had confiscated. Many of them had been put to death. And they were suffering some real trials. Well, the section of scripture I'm going to take today from 1 Peter chapter 1 begins in verse 3. And we're going to find in this sermon today that... This section of seven verses is kind of broken down into three themes. There is the good news, an overview, if you please, that begins it. There is the present reality, which includes suffering and trials. And then there is the outcome and the purpose and where those trials are going to lead. So let's read, first of all, verses three, four, and five. And then we're going to back up and unpack it a little bit and see what we can learn from it and how it applies to us today. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right? So first and foremost, we start out with praise. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth, <coughs> excuse me, into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and unto an inheritance that can never perish spoil or fade kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time now if we as Christians sit down and we think first and foremost about those three verses and we make that the center focus of our lives. <coughs> Excuse me. Maybe, Linda, uh, could you get a glass of water or something or any kind of a cup? Uh, having myself a throat itch here. But um, these verses, when you meditate on them, you quickly uh, lose the pity party uh, because it's just, just not necessary in the grand scope of what God is trying to do. And Peter, in spite of the fact that he and his audience were going through suffering, the first thing he wanted to do was say, Praise be to God. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> and then he goes on to say, In his great mercy, this is God's mercy toward us, he has given us a new birth. Now I'd like to stop right there because this new birth is something all of us, I hope, have experienced uh, and uh, can and claim for our own. Thank you. Uh, have myself a little whistle wedding here. Ah, much better. Go from there. But a new birth. Now, I'm sure all of you who are listening, uh, of course, have been born sometime, someplace to somebody. Most of you probably um, are parents, perhaps or have relatives, and maybe you've even witnessed a new birth. But it's a new entity. This new person, brand new. And this is what Jesus describes what our experience ought to be, that we are someone born brand new, like that little baby, to be formed into something entirely different than what we have been. All right? Because all of us came from a background <clears throat> excuse me, some better than others, but nonetheless a background that didn't have any hope, that didn't know where it was going or what it was doing, and uh, we have been born anew into a living hope, 
Not a dead hope, not something that uh, has no meaning to it, but a living hope. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry we had this little interruption here. This is what you get when you don't speak that often and your vocal cords get out of shape. But born into a living hope through, and this is what makes it all possible, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Because you see, Christ could be our Savior by merely dying. But he could not bring us to that life. He himself had to beget life by his own resurrection and new life. And so he was resurrected from the dead into an inheritance that can never perish. I'd like to stop for a moment and think about that phrase, an inheritance that can never perish. How many people, particularly for those of us here in California who are experiencing all these fires, how many people have watched their inheritance perish? For those of you that live down in the Gulf area and watched Hurricane Sally come through, and everything you have is standing under 10 feet of water, if it's even there at all. You just watch perhaps your inheritance, your home, maybe it was paid off, maybe you were going to leave it to your children, and now all of a sudden it is utterly gone. And that's what happens to inheritances that are physical. They perish. doesn't matter. They can get lost in stock market crashes. They can get lost by theft. Uh, they can get lost by foolish spending. But this inheritance that Jesus promises can never perish. It can never spoil. And it can never fade. You know, even things that um, might have a lot of intrinsic value to them, uh, maybe like fine tapestries, rugs, paintings, so on, if they're not really properly taken care of, they can fade and they're not like they originally used to be. Or they can spoil. Uh, you know, they can just deteriorate over time and not be there. But that is not the inheritance that God has prepared for us because it is kept in heaven for you. It is in the bank, if you please. Only this bank is in heaven and it's not subjected to being robbed or monetary risings and fallings, or stock market crashes, or any such thing. It is in God's bank, and it's never going to fade. <coughs> Excuse me one moment again. And it says, who through faith, and again, this is the belief that we must have, through faith, through our belief in God, are shielded by God's power. Now, what are we shielded from? Because uh, I can tell you for an absolute fact, if you think that this is a promise that God's people are going to be shielded by him, <clears throat> never to suffer any trials or difficulties, uh, I, I think you, you definitely have uh, missed the point of the book altogether. And I'll bet my boots you can find all kinds of Christians in fire zones who lost everything. You can find all kinds of Christians in floodplains who lost everything. And you can find Christians who have been robbed and set upon. And uh, we could go on and on and on and on. And it seems like God, it's not that he can't intervene from time to time. And maybe all of us can tell stories in our lives of where he did. But nonetheless, there's a time and chance element. All right, so if that's not what God shields us from, what is it? Well, it refers back to this inheritance, this promise, this hope kept for you in heaven. That is what's shielded by God's power and that nobody can take from you. And God is shielding and keeping that until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, last time, I think most of you are probably familiar with this, can refer to something specifically related to the second coming of Christ or as John referred to the time after Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection and the coming of the Holy Spirit, he said, we have now entered the last days. So anything since those, you know, events of the first century is the last time. And of course, we know that Christ, his plan, his purpose, the coming of the Holy Spirit 
has revealed to us who live in these last days, this last time, what it is that God is doing. So either way you want to look at it, um, God has waited in his plan and in his province to reveal his plan and what he wants to do. All right, so we, we get this overview. And this is what Peter is trying to point out to these beleaguered Christians scattered all over the place. Keep the big picture in mind. Don't forget what God is trying to do. Never lose sight of this. And if you've got that firmly locked in place, then you can deal with the rest. So now let's get down to what we might call this present reality that which we live now. He says, in this you greatly rejoice. Now the in this is what we just covered. You know, the plan, the hope, the resurrection, the inheritance, all that. In that you greatly rejoice. Now we come to the hard part. Though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Now, let, let's think about this for a minute. You can suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Now, I want you to notice that Peter brings out two realities here. First of all, when trials come, we're not expected to just put a smile on our face and say, joy, joy, joy. Yes, we may have an inner joy from what we first read here, but when trials come, there is grief. You don't lose a loved one to death without grief. You don't go through a bankruptcy without grief. You don't watch your house and belongings burn up in a fire without sorrow and grief and tragedy. That's just part of the human being. But notice we suffer grief in all kinds or manners of trials. You know there are there are big trials and there are little trials. Let me give you a, a, a classic example of a little trial. I have a certain idiosyncrasy in that I like in the morning uh, my coffee and I use for a creamer canned evaporated milk. Okay, It is my creamer of choice. So what I do is I get a can of evaporated milk and I get one of these uh, what we used to affectionately call a church key and I make you know, two holes on opposite sides of the can. And that way, uh, you know, you can pour out of one hole and it gets air in the other one. And, and oh, it makes a nice dispenser. And I just leave it right in the can. Don't bother to put it in a cream pitcher or anything else. Well, I was reaching for a nearly full can of this cream. And something was behind it that I was trying to maneuver around. And in my clumsiness, I pushed the can right off the shelf of the refrigerator and it turned and went all over the floor. And my first response was, honey, why am I calling my wife? What did she have to do with this? Well, she surely will have to find a way to blame her somehow. And honey, could you help me clean up this mess? And of course, the problem is, you know, the way refrigerators are constructed, you have the vegetable coolers, and some of them were cracked a little bit, and so the milk was going into the vegetables. And the milk was running down, and it was going back underneath the refrigerator. And I was going to have to take the grate off the front, and it was all on the floor. And it was just an ugly mess. Now, that's a little trial. But you see, a little trial, a little trial, a little trial, that, that can ruin your whole day. That can set up bigger trials. That can set up uh, what, what somebody affectionately called a tood. You know what a tood is? You got an attitude about something, and for short, it's a tood. Well, you got a tood going on here. And I had the makings of a good tood after I was looking at this mess on the floor. But as you can imagine, you know, get out the mop, get out the washcloth, get out the paper towels, get out this and that and other thing. Finally, after a while, it's all cleaned up. But the problem that I found was, is that we have a, a laminate floor, hardwood laminate, very shiny and slick. And even after I thought I got all the milk cleaned up, there is this scum that you can see where it was. So now I've got to get the mop out with a special cleaning solution for hardwood laminate floors, and I've got to mop the whole floor. This is turning into a big project over one little mistake. 
But big trials, little trials, whatever else the trials may be, why does, why does God allow us poor human beings? Why can't everything be perfect? Why, why, why do we have to have, you know, this grief that goes on all the time about big things and little things? Some of them we've caused by ourselves and our own stupidity. Other ones are brought on by other human beings who dump their stupidity in our lap and ask us to deal with it. Well, let's read the reason for that. All right? We, we suffer all these little kinds of trials. Notice verse 7. These have come, all right, here we go, so that your f faith, now, now what do we mean by our faith? Your basic belief in God, his sovereignty, his purpose, his plan, why you're on planet earth to begin with, that basic belief, which is of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Now let's go back to the spilt milk. How genuine is my faith? Or let's put it another way. If Jesus had spilled my can of milk all over the floor, how would Jesus have react, uh, 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 you know, reacted to this? Would he have gotten a bad attitude? Would he have yelled at his wife? Would he have cursed his existence on planet Earth? Would he, you know, we can go on and on and on with the whatever here. See, even little things like that, they are going to test where you're coming from, what you're made of, what's your patience level, what's your trust level in God. Are, are, are you able to cope without getting angry and losing it and sinning? Can you take it in a calm manner? Because I, I have learned over the years when I'm presented with something I don't like to ask myself this question. In your circumstances, what would be reasonable conduct for a Christian who is putting Jesus first? What would be reasonable conduct? To pitch a fit? No. To get in a bad attitude? No. To just simply realize you're a human being, these things happen, you clean it up, you make the best of the situation, and you go on. No big deal. That's what you would reasonably expect, because life is filled with these kind of things. And as anybody who's older knows, the older you get, the more things that break down, the more problems that have to be dealt with, and here we are. And you see, things are always changing. It, it's, it's like, let me give you another quick example of something that will give you a two. So my wife and I get a flu shot every, you know, fall or whenever they come out, and the flu shots were out. And I went down to the Sutter Clinic, who were a part of the Sutter Healthcare System here for our insurance and so on. And I went down to the clinic, and they have a gal there at the door this time, and she's got her mask on, and you have to have your mask on and all the rest. And she said, why are you here? You have an appointment? I said, no, but I'd like to make an appointment to, give flu, to get a flu shot for my wife and I. Well, sir, Sutter is not giving flu shots this year. I said, what? You're one of the biggest health care providers in Northern California. You're not even giving a flu shot? No, sir, you're not giving a flu shot. We don't do that this year. I said, why? See, I, I don't want to just take bureaucracy. I want to know answers. Well, because we just don't want to get messed up in the whole COVID thing, and people have to wear a mask, and this, and this, and this, and it's just too much bother. I thought, well, now, wait a minute. I didn't tell her this. I thought you were here to serve me, not me here to serve you. And this is what I didn't tell her. If I got my flu shot from you, my Medicare Advantage program will give it to me free. If I go down there to the CVS pharmacy, they're going to charge me five or ten bucks a head. I don't like to pay money I don't have to pay. And I smiled and said, thank you, ma'am. See, Jesus is starting to kick in now. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate the information. You have a good day now. I went to my car and looked at my wife and said, they're not going to give us a flu shot. We got to go back to CVS. And I just told that lady yesterday we didn't need hers that I was going to get mine at Sutter. Now I got to go back and tell her I didn't know what I was talking about. And I don't like to do that either. Oh, well, you, you know me by me over the years. I like to deal with real-life things. 
you know, that people deal with. But this is what life is. You know, these little things that come up, spilled milk and flu shots and all the rest, they are made to, to just simply show, are you really converted? Do you really get the point? Can you control yourself with God's help? Can you exercise the fruits of the Spirit no matter what the situation is that you may find yourself in? Can you do that? Well, we're going to find out. We're going to allow trials to come, God says. You're in the midst of an imperfect world, and we're going to see how well you do. But it's got a purpose, God said. We want to see your faith become like refined gold because that refined faith is going to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. When Jesus is going to come and say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Welcome into my kingdom forever. All right. So Peter says, This is the reality. This is the context. This is what God is striving to do regardless of the trial you may be going through. Now, let's go to verses 8 and 9, and we'll, we'll kind of look at the wrap-up or the outcome. So he says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Now, in Peter's case, of course, he had seen Jesus. He had spent years with Jesus. He had seen Jesus dead, seeing Jesus in a tomb, seeing the resurrected Jesus, and so on. So these people, however, that are scattered, who had not have that, they hadn't seen him, but they loved him anyway. And of course, they loved him because God enabled that love to be possible. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him, Peter says. And you are filled with with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Now, on a good day, I can tell you I've gotten glimpses of this inexpressible and glorious joy on a good day. There are other days when it seems to flee from me. It says, for you are receiving the goal of your faith, which is the salvation of your soul. All right? So, the goal, why we go through this, the purpose of trials from a biblical perspective is that it's helping to achieve that goal, the building of your faith that's going to result in the salvation of your soul. Now, something I'd like to dwell on here about the word soul. Just to be very basic here, there is body and soul. Okay? And, and uh, you know, there's a phrase that uh, when somebody says, well, how are you doing? Well, I'm still keeping body and soul together. You know what that means? That means you're still alive. Okay? You haven't died yet. <laughs> the soul and the body have not parted. Because when the soul and the body part and the soul goes back to God and the body goes into the ground or whatever you do with it, then they go asunder. And God is not interested so much in this body he wants to know about this soul. This is where the character, this is where the personality, this is where what he is doing and, and creating, this, this is the end product of it all, this, this, this soul. And so God says, you are receiving the goal of your faith, which is the salvation of your soul. And that's what it's all about. We are here to see our soul saved. And that's where the old expression uh, when America was big on revivals that says we're going to have a, a soul-saving campaign. And, you know, we're going to get these people to give their hearts to Jesus and walk down the sawdust aisle and, and uh, you know, make their profession of faith and all that good stuff. Well, I guess that's fine as far as it goes. But, of course, there is a life of, uh, you know, of, of building a relationship with God and all this other things that we've talked about here in this sermon today. So, to kind of tidy this up a little bit here, when we go through problems, whether they're little ones like spilt milk, 
or rather they're big ones like your house got burned down or your mate just died of the COVID in a intensive care unit of the local hospital. Whether it's a big trial or a little trial or an in-between trial, we've got to keep the biblical perspective in mind is that this life is for building a faith which is going to be like precious gold that's been refined and it's going to be forever with God in his glory in his kingdom. So I hope it's been helpful today. And as you go through viruses and heat and fires and missed church meetings and missing your fr- excuse me, missing your friends and whatever else you may be going through, uh, just remember there is a biblical perspective, and you have had brothers and sisters for 2,000 years who have suffered the same afflictions, some of them much worse, and uh, it is all for a reason and a purpose, <coughs> excuse me, which we have spelled out today. So please join me in a, in a closing prayer. Gracious God, thank you so much again for your love and mercy. And again for this letter that you inspired the Apostle Peter to write to scattered Christians, Jewish Christians, who he wanted to encourage and implore them to maintain the faith, which uh, is producing something that's more precious than gold. And Father, help us today to do the same. Help us, Father, whatever our circumstances may be and whatever difficulties may come our way to realize that you're always with us. You never fail us nor forsake us. And whatever trials we may go through are for a purpose and um, they are going to turn out well in the end. And this we ask and pray, Lord, in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Redeemer and friend Who would have thought that a lamb could Rescue the souls of men Oh, you rescue the souls of men Counselor, Comforter, Keeper Spirit we long to embrace You offer hope when our hearts have Hopelessly lost away Oh, we've hopelessly lost the way
for our benediction, the amazing grace of the Master Jesus Christ, the extravagant love of God, the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Amen.